Thank you. Thank you. I'll shake your hand. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I've actually never been to Nevis, so this is brand new experience for me. And I invite all of you to visit the sister campus on the other side of the river, the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where, where I work. I also work on Columbia Main Campus. I was there today. So happy to be uh, out here in Westchester to talk to you about um, volcanic eruptions. So we're going to start um, with a somewhat immersive experience. Imagine you're in an airplane and you're flying towards that volcano. Uh, you're flying to Anchorage, say, from somewhere in Asia. And the pilot knows that the volcano's erupting, although it's December and nighttime, so the visuals aren't great. And she does give, the pilot gives the, the volcano a wide berth, but still um, bad things happen. And what I'm going to play for you next is the actual uh, radio exchange between the pilot of KLM flight 867, the faded flight, and uh, Anchorage um, traffic control. It's going to be a little noisy and hard to hear, so I'm going to have the transcript for it. So, so we'll go. Thank you, KLM 867. Heavy is reaching level 252. Heading 147. Okay, do you have this sign on the uh, ash plume at this time? Yeah, it's just cloudy. It uh, could be uh, ashes. It's just a little browner than the normal cloud, but uh... it's a volcanic ash. Uh, we don't know. Well, we have to go left now. It's smoky in the cockpit at the moment, sir. Kilo eight six seven heavy roger left. It's your discretion. Yeah, we fly level three nine seven. Here is black cloud, and the heading is one three zero. It's just getting a little agitated. Okay, um, <laughs> you wouldn't want to be on that flight, and I could uh, hold you here for four minutes because that's how long the plane was in a free fall. Okay, all the engines had flamed out and it was in a free fall, heading towards the mountains around Anchorage. The pilot was frantically trying to restart the engines. The cockpit was filling with smoke. The cabin was filling with sulfur smells, smoke. People were panicking. They were feeling weightness, weightlessness. They were throwing up. Um, the pilot finally, miraculously, um, got the engines started again um, just before smashing into the mountains. So they regained power at around 13,000 feet. What happens is the volcanic ash is like glass and it melted inside the turbines and clogged them up, okay? But by kind of starting them over and over again, it could break up the glass and, and the plane um, landed safely. It wasn't easy because uh, the pilot couldn't see out the front because the windows were, were abraded by the ash. So she had to land by looking out the side window and talking to the co-pilot. I still get a little emotional thinking about this. <laughs> yeah, anyone, everyone landed safely. And um, what I like to point out is one airplane is about a big, a big jumbo plane like this, like a, um, is uh, $80 million. And I'll come back to this at the end. $80 million would pretty much monitor every volcano in the world, which we're not doing right now very well. So keep that in mind. All right, you may wonder why I'm telling you this story. Um, I'm telling you this story because 60,000 people a day fly over Alaska volcanoes, like the one I just showed you outside of Anchorage. Um, and more people than that fly uh, throughout the world uh, in very... Uh, heavy traffic airspace that's over um, active volcanoes. So this is something that potentially affects anybody. If you're flying from anywhere in Asia to anywhere in North America, you're going to fly over Alaska volcanoes. You might check the Alaska Volcano Observatory website before you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not just uh, um, people who live near volcanoes that are affected by them, so we all are, but there are eight 
100 million people who live within uh, 60 miles of an active volcano. This is uh, Calbuco, a very large city in Chile nearby. So a lot of people live in Chile, Indonesia, Japan, which have lots of volcanoes, and you know, even, even in this country. Anyone from Seattle? Been to Seattle? Yeah, been to Seattle. Do you know what that is? That is Mount Rainier. I hope you know that is a volcano. It's a very big, scary volcano. Um, this is the greatest volcano crisis waiting to happen in the US. When Rainier erupts, and it will, um, all that ice on top of Rainier will turn into uh, mud and rapidly flow down the volcano. Um, it, has, it has many times in the past. Most of uh, Tacoma is built on mud flows from the volcano. Um, if this happens again, I-5, gone. Uh, SeaTac Airport, gone. So this, this is a concern. Uh, the last eruption was 500 years ago of Mount Rainier. It could wake up tomorrow and erupt again. So uh, we have hazards here in the US that uh, we need to pay attention to. There are lahar detectors, a uh, new array on Mount Rainier, so there will be some early warning. OK, then there are really big eruptions, OK? This is Akmak Volcano, also in Alaska. I actually do a lot of work in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. I've been out to Akmak. It's pretty amazing. So that hole in the ground is six miles across. That happened during one volcanic eruption. So that was a big one. Um, it happened around BCE 43. And while there are no airplanes in the sky then, there was a thriving civilization in the Mediterranean, the Roman Republic. And this actually was the headline in the New York Times a few years ago when Akmak was finally identified as the volcano um, that led to a climate crisis in the Mediterranean at this time. So this is kind of a weird project projection. That's the North Pole. There's Akmak, Greenland, and then the Mediterranean. And th we're showing this because ash fell on the Greenland ice sheet, which we core. And so we found the ash and we're able to date it at BC 43 and then chemically fingerprint it to Akmak. So we know this all happened. Um, and this happened when Mark Antony and Cleopatra were doing their thing. But it also happened when uh, there was widespread famine. There were several years of abnormally cold temperatures in the Mediterranean. The Nile didn't flood for two years. Um, so this is, this is a time of, of, of real crisis um, in the Roman era and region and in the Ptolemaic uh, time as well. Um, we've been studying this eruption. Here's Ali Pecha. She's a graduate student working with me, um, measuring the sulfur that came out in this eruption because sulfur is the culprit for uh, climate effects of volcanism. What happens when volcanoes erupt? They send ash, but also gases like water, CO2, sulfur, fluorine, chlorine. Most of those rain out. The ash is too big. The others are soluble in rain, but sulfur is not. And sulfur has a very low solubility in rain. It continues up to the stratosphere where it forms sulfuric acid ice particles, little aerosols, that are about the right size to uh, reflect sunlight. And so it's scattering um, incoming sunshine and leads to cooling for years after volcanic eruptions. The sulfur stays up there for years. So big eruptions can affect us all. That's the, that's the moral here. And I'm showing this amazing eruption of Hunga Tonga that happened a few years ago. You may have heard about this. It had a boom. I mean, this was like near Fiji in the South Pacific in Samoa. There was a boom that was actually audible in Alaska. Um, this produced atmospheric waves that generated tsunamis in the Atlantic. So it had incredibly weird atmospheric responses. Fortunately, it didn't have that much sulfur. Otherwise, we'd all be really cold right now. <laughs> this would have been a, a, a mess. It was also erupting underwater, and that probably contributed to scrubbing the sulfur out. But other eruptions like Tambora in 1815, which is known as the year without the summer, here in New York, it was snowing in June. And again, widespread famine. Um, this was another big sulfur-producing eruption. The next one of these big eruptions, who knows? But on average, they occur a couple times every, every millennium. And one in five chances happen in the next 100 years. 
I think this is going to be the next global climate crisis will be a very large eruption. OK, there's also pretty eruptions. Okay, this is what Iceland is doing right now. Not, not to belittle the, the folks who've had to really evacuate and leave their village uh, in Grindvik because uh, these vol the, this area has been active now volcanically for years. Um, but it's mostly lava. You see this is a, a red eruption. Um, and you can pretty much outwalk lava. It's not going to catch up on you. Um, you might lose your house. But people don't generally die from, um, from red eruptions. All right, so this reminds me, I'm going to do a little, I'm going to try to do a little snippet from the fire of love, which is a, a love story between two volcanologists who were married. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Is it so funny that volcanologists would be in love? La curiosité est plus forte. All right, don't worry if you can't hear it. I have the, and they're speaking in French anyway. Katya and Maurice will eventually emerge from this crater unscathed and emboldened. On s'approche très près des volcans. C'est franchement pas vraiment extrêmement difficile. Ce type de volcan, les volcans rouges, sont des volcans gentils. They are the friendly ones, the red volcanoes. In the immense universe that is the classification of volcanoes, the crafts will eventually adopt two general classes: red and gray. Ce que les gens imaginent avec la lave qui coule, ça c'est les rouges, c'est les gentils. Et vous avez les volcans gris qui sont les tueurs, les volcans explosifs. Okay, so you get the point. There's red, there's gray, and I totally recommend this movie. It's actually lovely. Um, they w made volcanology famous in France. They were like the Jacques Cousteau of volcanology. And they did tragically uh, die in a volcanic eruption. There's two movies. There's another one by Werner Herzog, which is, which is, which is beautiful. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's tragic, but they, they knew what they were doing. They were dedicating their life to getting pictures that no one else could get of volcanic eruptions. So yeah, they, they started their career on the red volcanoes because they were easy and they were dramatic and they were red and you, you could get pretty right up close to them. But then when Mount St. Helens happened, they realized, okay, the, the serious volcanoes that produce climate problems and are dangerous are the gray volcanoes. And I'll tell you, even though you don't see them in the news as much, these are the ones that are active mostly right now and these are the most dangerous. Um, yeah, so you might... You know, how many volcanoes are there active right now? You might, you might be surprised to know that there are 46 volcanoes that are doing something right now. And this map has a weird um, center point. Usually you don't see maps that are centered on the Pacific Ocean, but that's because these are mostly around the Ring of Fire, around the Pacific. So you can see most of the volcanoes are surrounding the Pacific. And that's because uh, the Pacific plate is subducting, is sinking underneath Alaska, underneath Japan. These subduction zones, by the way, where plates collide, were invented at Lamont, uh, where I work. 50 years ago, Lamont had a huge role in big parts of the plate tectonic puzzle, and we invented subduction zones, I think. Uh-oh, this is going out on YouTube, isn't it? I'm going to get some people arguing with me tomorrow. <laughs> I'll still stand by it. So um, most of these volcanoes uh, are the dangerous explosive gray ones, and uh, these are the ones we need to understand. That's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on. What makes a volcano gray or red? Why are some eruptions more explosive than others? And of course, it's all about tiny bubbles. It's about the bubbles. And all about the bubbles. The all right. Not time for wine yet, but pretty close. OK, so uh, it's about the bubbles. It's exactly the same as, um, exactly, but it's a good model, is a seltzer bottle. Um, you shake it up, you open the cap quickly, and the gas comes out and flings liquid particles with it. So it's when you have mostly gas with liquid. That's an explosive eruption. Um, and that's what volcanoes do. The gas is propelling, it's the expansion of the gas that's propelling the liquid out of the ground and causing the liquid to disperse into particles. Um, you know, in a seltzer bottle, the gas is coming out because you release the pressure by opening the cap, but magmas naturally release their pressure just by rising through the earth, 
where they have less and less pressure, less, fewer and fewer like rock overburden as they rise. And when magmas rise, um, they can start out with, for example, water, which is the main gas that comes out volcanoes. I've talked about sulfur, there's CO2, but the main gas is water. Um, and the water can be fully dissolved in the magma at depth, just as the CO2 can be fully dissolved in the seltzer when you have the cap on. Um, but then as it rises and lowers in pressure, it hits um, the bubble line, as you see over there, um, or saturation. And so water then can no longer be held in the melt, and it has to dissolve as a bubble. So now we have bubbles, and as the magma keeps rising, it's buoyant, it's rising to the surface, it has to stay on the bubble line, and so the, the melt itself gets, gets lower and lower and lower in water, so there's no water left because all of it has gone into the bubbles. So you have more and more bubbles, more and more buoyancy, kaboom. Okay? So that's, that's what fuels volcanic eruptions, and that's what makes them explosive. And if you read the textbooks, they will tell you that more water, more explosive. Makes sense, right? Um, but my graduate student just didn't buy that. Um, this is Anna Barth, great graduate student. She's now at Berkeley. Um, and you see she's, she's good at digging pits on volcanoes. <laughs> this is Sara Negro in Nicaragua. She dug that pit that she's standing in. It was 100 degrees outside. And then here's uh, Mount Etna in Sicily. We dug another pit. Um, we'll just show you Sara Negro. This is kind of a nice big black cone. Um, Turns out you can actually go volcano boarding on Cerro Negro <laughs> if you are crazy enough to want to do that because Cerro Negro does this every once in a while, okay? So you don't want to be volcano boarding when it's doing that. It produces a big, again, gray eruption, hazardous ash cloud, um, and it's erupted many times. All right, so that's Cerro Negro. Mount Etna, this is for the White Lotus fans in the audience. Um, that really was Etna in the background that was erupting while the, while the show was going on, while they were filming. It took place in Sicily, right? So that's where Etna is. But Etna's had very big eruptions, um, bigger than Cerro Negro. So Anna was studying Cerro Negro 92, which it was modestly, modestly explosive. It had a seven kilometer ash plume. You know, the height of the ash plume is kind of one measure of the intensity of the, of the eruption. And then Etna, um, okay, I'm faking it. This is actually a 4,000-year-old uh, eruption that she was studying, but it had the equivalent of this volcano today, um, the ash plume, just to give you a sense of how much more explosive it was than, than Cerro Negro. We talk about the volcanic explosivity index. It's kind of like the earthquake scale when you say oh, it was a five. Everyone feel it? Yeah. The five? Yeah, my house shook in Nyack, yep. Um, so yeah, this is uh, like the earthquake magnitude scale, so this is 10 times bigger than that. It's, it, it's a log scale. What Anna realizes, there are these two eruptions that were an order of magnitude different in their explosivity, and yet they actually had the same water content. So she measured the original water content in these. And she's like, Terry, the textbooks are wrong. And I'm like, okay, figure it out. What, what, do you, what do you need? What's wrong with the seltzer bottle? The seltzer bottle seems perfect. And so we thought about it, and we thought, well, you know, really we're not thinking about the seltzer bottle right, because anyone knows if I shook up the bottle and I handed it to you, and you did not want it to spray on your friend's face, what would you do? There you go. You go, ch -ch -ch, you let the gas out slowly, okay? So it doesn't matter how much gas is in the bottle, it's how fast you open the cap. And in magmas, that's how fast it rises and is decompressing. If it moves really fast, it brings all the gas with it. If it moves really slowly, the gas can actually leave ahead of it, just like you're letting the gas out ahead of the liquid. So that was Anna's hypothesis, and um, she was thinking, okay, so this, this eruption, maybe it had a faster decompression rate. The magma was racing to the surface faster than it did for this eruption. And so she needed a clock, something that could measure rate. And what we came up with was a clock that's not that different from what happens to a turkey if you take it out of the oven. This might have been around Thanksgiving time. We were thinking about this. You take a th turkey out of the oven and put it on the counter. Um, it's all hot. If you wait 20 minutes, you know, the outer part has cooled off. If you wait an hour, you know, even the inside of the turkey is going to cool off, right? And in fact, the shapes of these curves are exactly what you would expect from heat conduction or thermal diffusion. 
If you know the time scale of thermal diffusion, you could actually, know, and if you measured this profile, you would actually know when your sister took the turkey out of the oven. If it had this profile, you'd say, oh, it came out 20 minutes ago. If it had this profile, you'd say, okay, hour ago. Um, this is not too different from how in forensics you tell how long a dead body has been around. It's how much it's cooled. Anyway, Anna wasn't going to use thermal diffusion. We were going to use chemical diffusion, but same principle. And we're not using a turkey. We're going to use a crystal of olivine. Olivine is a magnesium iron silicate. It's a beautiful green mineral. A bunch of people here must have the gemstone peridot. Yep, that's olivine. Um, it's a common mineral that crystal, was the first crystals to form in a magma as it rises towards the surface of the earth. Um, and what we were going to look at was water in the olivine. So here's the idea. The olivine crystal is growing in the magma as it's cooling a little bit. Um, the magma is surrounding it. And the magma has all this water in it. It hasn't come out yet in the bubbles. Um, it has the water. Um, and there's going to be a little water in the olivine too. And they're going to be in equilibrium at that time. Then the magma is going to start to move to the surface. And the magma is going to lose its water. And then the olivine is going to lose its water. But the rate at which it does that is going to be kind of like the turkey. right? So it's going to look very similar. Um, if it came to the surface and, uh, and, and we... Well, this is, this is time going by, okay? So that's the same thing. This looks like the turkey profiles. Um, the concept would be if, um, if, if it raced to the surface really fast, the olivine wouldn't have that much time to lose its water, just like the turkey didn't have much time to cool. If it moved really slowly to the surface, then the olivine would, would actually have time to lose its water, and it would have a profile down here. So the olivine is leaking more slowly than the magma. That's kind of how this is working. So we know thermal diffusivity, but we didn't really know how long this process took. How long does it take water to diffuse through an olivine crystal? And so Anna went into the lab. At Lamont, we have a lab where we can melt rocks and make magma. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we can take an olivine crystal. So Anna picked out a big, beautiful olivine and polished it and oriented it, because it really depends on the crystallographic orientation. And this crystal already had water in it, and she dangled it in the furnace and watched it lose water. And she found out that um, if this was the original crystal, in 20 minutes, it had lost half of its water in the middle of the crystal and had lost 80% of its water at the edge. In 40 minutes, it had almost lost all of its water. So this is a fast process. And she could make these measurements at our lab next door. This is an infrared spectrometer. Water absorbs infrared just like CO2 does. That's the greenhouse effect. So if you shine infrared light in, uh, it excites the OH bonds in the olivine crystal, and you can quantify how much water is in it. And so these were her measurements. Here is the Cerro Negro olivine, the less explosive eruption. Um, here's the Etna olivine, the more explosive eruption. The black dots are her measurements. And then the red curve is the diffusion model for six and a half hours in this case and 15 minutes in that case. Notice this is a really big crystal. This is crystals even bigger and it's lost more. So it's a bigger turkey that's lost more, sat, sat around for a longer period of time. Anyway, these are remarkably fast. 15 minutes from six miles depth is what we're talking about. So the magma has to be that deep to have all the water in it. So in 15 minutes, it came six miles to the surface. That's why it was an explosive eruption. The gas could not come out. You open the cap really fast. That's 24 miles an hour. That's like how fast you can run. So Anna did prove her hypothesis correct. Um, the decompression rate for these two volcanoes that she measured from those time scales, this was an order of magnitude bigger than this one, and this one's more explosive than that one. So it goes in the right direction. I know, you're saying it's only two data points. All right. So we did more work, and uh, now we have more data points. And um, yeah, there's generally a relationship. This was Etna. This is Cerro Negros. They were kind of the end members, but we filled them in. And the decompression rate scales with the intensity of the eruption. The textbooks are wrong. This has nothing to do with water. It's how fast magmas are moving to the surface. 
So there's good news and bad news here. One is we've actually isolated the parameter that, ex that affects how explosive an eruption is going to be and a hazard to aircraft and to climate and all of these things. The bad news is it's only minutes to hours. It's not giving us a lot of warning, right? <laughs> We're not going to evacuate anybody in a few minutes. Fortunately, volcanoes do a lot more than this before they erupt. This is kind of the last thing that happens as the magma races to the surface and erupts. But there are a lot of things that volcanoes do in the preparation of eruption. More role playing, okay? Pretend you are uh, the head of Mount St. Helens National Park and you look down at the, at the helicopter this morning where it's recording earthquakes on Mount St. Helens, the volcano. This is a 30 minute record, so this is an entire day. Each one of these little blips is a tiny little earthquake that's happening under Mount St. Helens. And you're like, hmm, this looks a little more than yesterday. I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, three days later, you're like, oh, this looks like a lot more earthquakes. Uh, I don't know, and I'm not ready to close the park yet. Let's see what happens tomorrow and the next day. Okay, all right, we better close the park. Oh my God, should we evacuate the state of Washington? What do we do next? Oh my, look at this. Do we evacuate the state of Washington? I'm not ready to yet, but I don't know. Okay, it erupts the next day, a very small eruption that's mostly steam. Okay, this is, I'm afraid, <laughs> a lot of what forecasting is, is really just looking at unrest and guessing what's going to happen we are not there yet to have a physics-based model on what all this seismicity means. Is it gas? Is it magma? But giving us lots of warning signs to measure, okay? Here's something else we can measure, uh, volcanic gas. So um, this is a gas plume coming out of a volcano, and then it had a small eruption. That's no big deal. And then it's venting more and more gas. So this is actually just a pretty picture in the background. What I'm going to emphasize is this record, which is going to come around again. This record is measuring several years of that gas coming out the volcano, like measuring its breath. It's like a breathalyzer. And we're measuring the CO2 to sulfur ratio. And it's like two to three, two to three for a year. And then it jumps up to eight. And then those triangles are an eruption. And then it jumps back down again, steady state, steady state. And then it jumps back up two weeks again before the next eruption. So this, this is actually pretty cool. We didn't know volcanoes did this that the gas chemistry changes a couple weeks before the eruption. So these are colored because they're anomalously high. And then that's the eruption. And then boom, it jumps up again. That's the eruption. So several volcanoes. There's about 12 of these instruments. These are little pelican cases that are sitting on volcanoes that have sensors inside and sucking the gas in and radioing the data back. Incredibly valuable data, but we clearly need more than 12 of them out there because this looks like a really useful precursor. In weeks, you can actually evacuate people. And then there's things that happen years before eruption. So this is a volcano in Alaska again, and this is a little movie. Each one of these ticks is a year. So we're looking at um, eight years of data. And what we're looking at is literally the ground surface going up and down measured from space, so from uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar. But you could also do this with GPS instruments. Um, and it's really incredible. It's clearly exaggerated a bit, but um, the volcano swells, and then that's an eruption in 92. It goes down, and then it swells again. So volcanoes literally have these breathing cycles. They inflate while the magma is filling them, and then when they erupt, they deflate, and then they start filling again. So some volcanoes do this. These are ones that actually don't have gas. The ones that have gas don't do the inflation. So we need to be measuring all of these signals to understand what's going on. This is not really forecastable either. It's telling you years before the eruption, there's magma coming into the system. But there are physics-based models that, 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 um, that predict when the rock will finally break, when you've inflated it so much that you're going to cause the rock to break. And those have a lot of uh, promise as actual forecast models. So minutes to hours, that's the last thing that happens. The magma is racing to the surface. That determines the explosivity. Days before earthquakes, weeks before gas, years before inflation. We need to be measuring all of these things, and we need to have them in a physics-based model that is actually making a quantitative prediction instead of just saying, like, oh, my God, there's a lot of seismicity. 
like a game of chicken and cry wolf at the same time. So uh, the state of volcano science right now is that we know these signals are out there, but most volcanoes are still poorly instrumented. I said most don't have these gas boxes on them. Most of the data are not actually transmitted in real time, nor are they open. A lot of the data stay um, at the local observatory. Most forecasts are based on just patterns of unrest or what the volcano did last time, which turns out to be really crummy because volcanoes are not cyclical. Um, and most eruptions are a big crisis and not studied scientifically. So you're sensing some of my frustration right now. I can kind of, I can taste it, you know? This is like, this is like the 1930s, you know, trying to understand hurricanes before there were buoys everywhere and open radar data and, you know, physics models where we understood how sea surface temperature relates to hurricanes and then multiple groups can look at the same data and put their models out there in the spaghetti models and give you an actual forecast. That's my dream, right? We want to be like hurricanes. And we can do that. We, we just haven't, we don't have open data yet. We don't have the data yet. We'll get there. So we're, tr we're working on this a bit. Uh, we have a project called AVERT. I think it's a pretty good acronym because it actually means something, but, but stands for Anticipating Volcanic Eruptions in Real Time. And this was funded by the Moore Foundation. Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel um, and provides funding for scientific endeavors, which was really exciting. This is the first volcano project they funded. And it was a pilot study of how can we put a multi-sensor array around a volcano? We chose really remote ones, Akmak, you saw Akmak, that's what brought down the Roman Republic. And then Cleveland is right next to it, has a big gas plume all the time. Akmak's inflating all the time. So we put out five arrays. We have really wacky things that we're measuring the magnetic field and soil temperature. Um, we are sending the data out by Starlink now, satellite telemetry to anywhere in the world. Uh, we have computers on site doing a little processing. And we're hoping to kind of get the price tag down to maybe a million dollars per array. 80 volcanoes are active right now doing something. Okay, there's the $80 million, I promise you, from the airplane, right? One airplane, and we could do this. So, yeah, we pitched an audacious project. It didn't work, but you got my pitch. Okay, so uh, you've been great. I just want to end by thanking all the graduate students and postdocs who've worked with me. They're really a fantastic bunch and uh, happy to take any questions. Um, and thank you.